Diseases of the modern era are ones that can really be anywhere in the world in a short period of time. I think we all know at this point, but as our societies have become more interconnected than ever through things like trade, tourism, and in general just interactions, a virus, bacteria, or parasite could make their way from one side of the planet to the other quite easily in just the course of a few hours. What would originally start as a highly virulent and dangerous disease in one hemisphere that slowly had to make its way through the population to become typically more and more tolerable can now run through the entire globe in the same wild type stage that ultimately makes it more dangerous. In the events of Anna and the Apocalypse, it's officially Christmas, which if this comes out, I think it will, so Merry Christmas to you as well. A new variant of what is supposedly the flu or a mystery virus has begun spreading across the planet. In the small town of Haven, however, they really don't care because surely that could never spread here. Spoiler, it definitely can spread there. As the days pass and the school gets prepared for a play, the surrounding area becomes inundated with a specific form of infected that appear to have completely altered forms of metabolism. But how exactly are these infected staying alive despite grievous wounds, and how much of the virus may impact them? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode. So we kick off today's story with the realization that this is actually a musical, and though the description did say it, I thought they were joking. Uh, they are not joking. As a dad, his daughter, and her friend drive to school, the CDC has issued a warning about the new flu virus that has turned lethal, which arguably is pretty horrifying given how virulent the flu actually is. And along with that, yes, I know it can be lethal, but if it turns towards the skill tree, humanity is definitely going to have a difficult time. And along with that, the reality is we already did have a fun time with something like this in the past. I believe it was the Spanish flu, which really the only reason it was called Spanish flu is because the Spaniards were pretty much neutral during World War I and reported on it while other countries that were currently engaged in battle didn't want to lower morale. If I recall, the estimates of actual people that dropped from this disease usually healthy young men and women, were somewhere around 52 million worldwide. And this flu was just that, a form of influenza that was incredibly difficult to get under control. Interestingly, a lot of us get a variant of the Spanish flu now, we just simply don't regard it anymore as dangerous as it once was. Same can be said for a lot of respiratory viruses that are still floating around. But as they talk about Anna going to school, John over here lets slip that she has a plane ticket. She's going to explore Australia after high school instead of going to college. I mean, what's wrong with a gap here? There are worse things that you could do, and sometimes the path of education only until it's time to work, until it's time to die, isn't just the way forward. Although education is important, because, I mean, let's be real, we do need more people in the STEM field. But it's actually kind of funny. Americans go backpacking through Europe, and Europeans go backpacking through Australia. And Australians go backpacking through the ninth circle of hell. See? Everyone has their goals. The dad is distraught over this news, but you know, what can you do? The offspring are technically becoming adults physically at that age, and mentally it's another story. I say this only because I too now am old. Heading inside, the dad then talks about how stupid it is, maybe going a little over the top mentioning her mother. And yes, just remember, things said in anger can't be taken back. Tough lesson to learn, but a necessary one. John walks in, knocking over everything immediately as he starts talking with Anna. He tells her, yeah, it's a great idea to go, you know, as a lone woman to a country you've never been before to walk across vast areas of a desert. What could go wrong? Probably my voice cracking. From here, remember, it's a musical. Again, I thought it was totally a joke. It is not. So after we have a nice song about breaking away from life and how everything draws to a close, it's rather connected to my own existence. I too may go take a few weeks to do a walk about in the Northwest on a solo adventure given recent events. What's the worst that could happen? Besides maybe being taken out by Dogman's cousin or something. Also, like nobody goes to this school. So the headmaster walks on stage talking about hand sanitizer is your best friend, but kissing on the mouth is not. Very true, more so when there's a lethal strain of flu going around. Also, the headmaster is a bit of a knob. While he goes on ad nauseum, we get a one-to-one -one shot of the scene from Dead Space 2 where the sun comes out of nowhere and scares the absolute crap out of everyone. As Anna begins hearing wheezing while walking down a hallway later on, again, I must stress there's like 12 people in this school, Nick starts asking if Anna wants to hook up before she leaves. The absolute state of his riz over here. Good God, I'm getting old. Heading over to the cafeteria for lunch, Anna emasculates John by saying he wouldn't do anything anyways. Couldn't be me. And that's why you're getting put in the friend zone, my man. Do something impulsive. Flip a table. I hear the ladies love it. It is at this point we realize we have been missing something for at least the last 14 minutes. So we now jump into another song about how John is becoming more and more annoyed by these comments. Advice from Papa Roanoke, don't let anyone ever emasculate you. And that goes for the 9% of my audience that are women too. Never let someone, uh, defeminate you. That was the word I looked up. Gotta shut that nonsense down immediately. Otherwise, it sets the tone for the future. Also, are there zombies in this movie? It is possible. So Steph brings up Anna's mom in the parking lot like a huge dork and goes 
over about as well as a wet fart in church as you would expect. Man, as she walks away, oh, is that a zombie? Did you not notice that dude? Like, do people not look at each other when they actively run into them? So the first thing we notice is the infected are actually not very responsive to their environment that they are currently in. And given Anna just ran into one and then walked off without looking, I can only assume this is a human trait specific to this town. However, upon looking at him, we can see things are just beginning to happen that will be exhibited in the rest of the infected. Pretty much across the board, what we will come to find out is there are all kind of a standard presentation of symptoms such as pale skin that appears to also be sweating, indicating that there's some form of immunological response or the body is having difficulty regulating an internal temperature range. This could be for a multitude of reasons, which we will get into during the neurology section, but one of the more strange traits that will actually later crop up that kind of helps support these points is the changing of the iris pigmentation. The infected across the board will have their iris changed to an extremely pale blue, almost devoid of all pigmentation, but not enough to make them an albino, indicating internally the cellular activity is being disrupted, which will lead to cascading issues. So Anna then goes to work at the bowling alley, and she mentions how Christmas is now her least favorite holiday. And bro, the month I've been having, I... I don't even know that it's Christmas. It's like, it just, it's kind of snuck up on me. But to you guys, I hope it's going better for you. So Merry Christmas, joy bound over there. Uh, when will I stop bemoaning current events? Who knows, that's the fun. Meanwhile, at the play, it's a packed house, as you can tell. The whole town is here. As Lisa goes to sing her song, she starts talking about how her chimney needs unblocking. Ah yes, makes sense. Christmas music for certain. Also, her boyfriend is completely missing. As the headmaster goes to confront her because she's it's like, you can't sing that. He hears banging sounds on the door. He begins talking to whoever is out there and then goes to open it. We see blood on the walls outside as Anna says she can't hang out with John anymore because he's sad. Oh, okay then, so I guess we're not friends. So as John goes to throw a shoe, he ends up knocking the cleaner unconscious. So they do the right thing and just kind of leave her there as they go head out to lay in the snow. John offers to go backpack with Anna, but she doesn't really respond to it. Commander Shepard had it right concerning getting out of there when Ashley said she needed more time to think about it. <laughs> Anyways, the next morning, Anna wakes up and she's late for school, which is weird because it's already the 23rd, so you would think they would have school off at this point, but nope. So as she heads outside to do her next musical number, there's blood all over the light posts. Things are on fire, and the area is littered due to the battle with people actually just running for their lives in the background. I think maybe the infected are actually just regular people of specifically this town, because they're just completely oblivious to what's going on around them. As she dances along, People are getting obviously got and consuming one another, and luckily everyone who's a main character though is completely immune to being hunted by the infected. For now anyhow, it gets really dark later. Also, uh, wasn't there just snow on the ground the night before? I mean, I guess a warm front could have come through, I don't know. So John and Anna now meet in the graveyard, turning it into a RAVEYARD. <laughs> That joke took way too long to remember, and as they dance with one another, because he's trying to date her and she's just dancing, uh, it's sort of like being interested in crystals for astrology women in terms of what you're willing to do. Frosty then approaches them and immediately falls over. At first they are concerned when looking at him, but they quickly see he's covered in blood and clearly infected. He lumbers towards them as they begin to panic, trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. And again, look how slow these things move. Are they really a threat? Which, let's complain about the movement for a second. When looking at the movement of the infected, it denotes something in particular about the nervous system and the musculature, specifically an issue with the neuromuscular junctions. Now typically the flu is a respiratory disease first and foremost, however it is well known that during the acute phase of the infection, which is the beginning, that neuroinflammation is most definitely a part of the symptomatic expression roster. When the body begins to fight the infection, this inflammation is pretty critical to stopping a virus from just completely ransacking your body freely, but with the flu in particular, the hippocampal region is typically affected. However, considering this isn't just your run-of-the-mill influenza viral infection, with this new version, there is not too much that is actually known about it, but you know Papa Roanoke is here to make a few assumptions based on context clues, which is what this whole channel is about. Due to the fact that the viruses can, in fact, affect neural functioning and inflammation, while this virus would be contracted by respiratory means initially, it's clear it will then later spread through vectors such as biting, indicating that bodily fluids in general are contaminated with this virus, such as the saliva, although it is possible it's coming up from the lungs. Then this is pretty normal for something like rabies, per se. However, for the other neurological viruses, a similar pathway may be followed. Once infected via the lungs for at least a few people, the virus would quickly enter the bloodstream of a person through the alveolar sacs. Entering the pulmonary vein, it would then travel to the heart and through the ventricles, where it would be quickly blasted up through the aorta, where some would inevitably end in the cerebral arteries. From here, this is where things begin to go wrong. It is not known how long the incubation time of this virus is, however, what I can tell you is sometimes viruses will contain toxins. These toxins are not like bacterial toxins, which are produced 
to be toxic, but just simply the structure of the virus itself will be toxic to the body. This toxin can induce a whole host of issues, and in this case, I believe it would be something like brain swelling. Once it has entered the more constricting vessels of the brain, it is here it will likely begin moving into the brain itself. As it bypasses the blood-brain barrier, it would begin immediately causing issues for the brain down the road. The meninges of the brain will begin swelling, putting pressure on the brain, causing damage to begin building up. But along with that, given what we will see with the bites here in a moment, there may be more going on than just natural functions such as encephalitis and meningitis. Obviously, encephalitis is also swelling of the brain. As the fight continues, Anna is able to literally smack his head off with a teeter-totter. John gets it almost immediately, saying that this guy is a zombie, as now we can see they can survive for an extended period of time being just ahead. But what does this indicate about the metabolism? Let's jump back into the science after like four sentences. So, much like the Dawn of the Dead movie with the head in the cooler that I totally forgot about and it was still alive, this would require some pretty stark changes to the functioning of an individual cell. This presumed virus would have to change some critical components of cellular operation, but in theory, it could be done. Upon removing the head of a zombie, the brain is still intact, and because of that, the zombie will stay there trying to bite. But it should be noted, in those that have their brains destroyed, it is officially over for them. But using this reasoning, we can surmise that the brain is still in control and functional post-infection. From here, it becomes about examining how the brain can operate under these conditions. Because the head was knocked off, and if Francis uses the guillotine with a doctor wanting to know how long a person can stay conscious for is anything to go off of, we know that's about 15 to 30 seconds, but they're clearly in a state of shock. Then it becomes clear the infected possess the ability to remain functional well beyond that. This would require cellular respiration beyond what our bodies are capable of in their current form. During the infection process, the initial shock of toxic material to the brain would alter the behavior quite quickly as the immune system would go into panic mode. Inflammatory cytokines are released, swelling up the tissue to try to stop the infection, but this hilariously uh, is outmatched, and it really does the opposite of help in most instances. It just makes it worse. Good job, body. But with the virus in the brain itself, it would clearly begin infecting the neural tissue on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. It would seem like to me that anyone that was bitten would most definitely be dealing with this issue. Some neurons would ultimately meet their end, undergoing apoptosis, which in turn breaks connections in the brain, releasing more viruses, and this would be a long-standing issue that could not be corrected. As an assault on the central nervous system is launched, it's important to remember that the peripheral nervous system is also up for grabs, which will explain the ungainly gait. But once the virus infects the nervous system, it appears as though it may in fact be a retrovirus implanting something into your genome, which would be a subset of genetic coding that may drastically later alter the metabolism of a cell. Now, typically aerobic respiration gives us the adenosine triphosphate that we need, or ATP. Well, not typically, it does. But in times of extreme physical demands, anaerobic respiration will take over allowing for us to produce less ATP but still utilize a crap ton of like you know glucose but the cell will still maintain its ability to survive and function by using this method. This method of respiration is massively inefficient for our cells, however, and we can really only rely on it and it be sustained for like a few seconds to maybe at most two minutes. The issue is the brain requires so much energy that this method cannot be sustained for very long. Within six minutes of no oxygen, your brain is going to start dying off in large swaths. 10 minutes in and there's no point in reviving you because you are officially brain dead. That is, unless you fall into cold water, in which case, you aren't dead until you're warm and dead. But because of the head on the ground, this would clearly mean this method of anaerobic respiration is being conducted and it must be an altered process. The biggest issue is inefficiency of anaerobic respiration in comparison with aerobic respiration. Glycogen is depleted quickly and as a consequence, the cell dies. The information implanted from the virus must in some ways make aerobic respiration not the main metabolism of the cell, but make anaerobic respiration more efficient, allowing for them to take in nutrients, which will be seen when they eat non-infected, but having oxygen presence no longer necessary on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, which means, you know, the lungs being used to take in oxygen or the circulatory system used to deliver the oxygen is no longer as necessary. The metabolism of the neurons and really of all cells connected have changed drastically to be able to survive in an anaerobic environment for longer as there is no blood supplying oxygen once the head is lost. They would, however, still starve over time because you're still going to run out of glucose as even the head would begin to run out through natural processes, meaning that this is a self-limiting issue. So as they sit at the park, they begin to hear explosions, but their phones won't work due to presumably damage to the cell phone towers in the chaos. Everyone is trapped in the school and had to stay there that evening as the infected are outside. While that's going on, Chris and Steph head over to the bowling alley while John and Anna approach. So finally, we get an update. The virus has not yet been identified, it was definitely not the flu, but it is spreading across the world. Well, that sounds familiar. Also, Justin Bieber got turned into a zombie, allegedly. 
That night, as they sit in the ball pit, we can all be thankful that this is not a Dashcon ball pit incident. Chris and John talk about which celebrities got caught in the crossfire to boost rankings in the SEO. As Steph and Anna talk in the bathroom, they open up a stall and realize the cleaner from earlier has been infected. Steph takes her out with quite a few of the infected, then breaking through the wall entirely. And at this point, John goes to destroy the brain as it becomes a massive fight to not get bitten. Again, by taking out the infected who are up and walking by inducing brain death through physical damage, this shows the brain is in fact still in control of the body, but just severely altered. Over at the school, the headmaster then brings up how they're going to have to prioritize as clearly a battle is taking place all over the city and they don't have time to help Chris's grandmother. I mean, honestly, like he's a jerk about it, but this seems like a medication issue. And if you don't have the medication on hand, what exactly are you supposed to do? Go out there to her house and potentially get infected? Like it's a harsh reality, but a necessary one to understand. Like the guy is definitely a jerk, but he's speaking straight facts. Mr. Shepard then has a nice cry, assuming his daughter is donezo. And the last thing he said was really stupid to her. And of course, we have to break out into another musical number. Probably the worst part about this is the complete breakdown of the internet and ability to communicate with one another. So the next morning, as they wake up in the ball pit, they find the military has been pretty much all but destroyed and turned into zombies, which everyone was banking on the base being so close to their town. But I mean, how did this happen? So they decide to put a pool over their heads and then walk out, hoping this will provide them with enough cover. Interesting logic. As Chris looks out, he sees zombies all around them and they have now like sat on the pool as one zombie pees. So another interesting aspect about this is that would imply bodily functions are still ongoing despite the nervous system being overrun by the virus. And this means the body is very likely still alive in all meanings of the word. However, it is a metabolic cycle of the cell that has changed. This is further supported when he says that the pee is warm. Metabolism produces body heat. And this would further imply the body is maintaining a body temperature, likely above normal ranges though, as an actual illness is present and that's still producing heat. So this is a sign of metabolic activity, which is a sign of life. So not undead, just infected. Boom, baby. It all hinges on warm pee. That cannot be disproven. So as the infected become quickly aware of them, they start grabbing at the pool, but luckily Nick ended up saving them as they are out there looting. I mean, the dude did just absolutely save y'all though. So like, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And see, here's the thing. Nick also knows what's up. They keep making like, I get it. The headmaster's a jerk and Nick is considered to be uh, a douche, I guess you could say, but they're kind of the ones speaking facts. And Nick over here is like, he knows what to do. He says, I'm not a hot, I'm not hiding. I'm a hunter. At this point, we break into another musical number. I mean, this guy actually, you know, knows how to do something and he's dropping infected left, right and center. So definitely time to squad up with that dude. Papa Roanoke would be squatting up with him is all I know. You're welcome to join if you like. But of course, the other group is not impressed because it's better to hide. How very French, I mean, British. It is at this point, the people in the school are now wanting to leave. The headmaster wants them to stay as he's developed a plan, but nobody wants to hear it because he's a huge nerd. Arthur is having that breakdown over the fact that people want to go get their offspring. I mean, just let them go, man. He states, this is my swamp. Clearly losing touch with reality now as I guess this breaks them. So it's at this point, the group of pre-adults move through the streets somehow totally devoid of zombies. Oh, by the way, John and Anna, they're not dating. I don't know if like, I said friend zone several times. So yeah, he's in the friend zone. John, it's time to bail out of that one, brother. Once you're in the friend zone, you just gotta walk away and find someone new to play with if you're romantically interested. And you can't be friends? Well, you can be friends, but it'll never be anything more. Approaching a Christmas tree emporium, what in the name of all is holy is that? You have to go through there to get to school before like the sun goes down. I mean, I feel like you could definitely go around and to be honest, using the darkness of night to avoid zombies is a better move anyhow. But hey, what do I know about avoiding zombies and not getting eaten? As they make their way through, the infected are seemingly all over the area hiding in trees. They're in the trees, man. As someone makes a mad dash, most of the crew is then turned into infected as the bite changes you in minutes. Nick's friends all get turned, but luckily Anna and her crew all survive. What are the odds? Hiding in the back room, they then get ready to go out once more as John brags about knowing all of the reindeer as his hand is then bitten, ensuring his art career is over. The infected now approach them as John throws Anna, and then John is bitten a ton of times by the infected. See, that's what you get for going after a woman who puts you in the friend zone. So Anna begins fighting her way through the infected as they now head to the school. They find the headmaster eating his Christmas dinner alone with everyone having just left. Arthur opens the door for them as they then head into the area where the people were seeking shelter and they find everyone has turned. Arthur allowed an infected in that then infected everyone else. He blows the whistle, alerting the infected of their presence like a real POS as he then breaks into a wonderful joyous song while the group starts fighting for their lives against the 
infected. They are able to get one of the window grates open and escape. Entering the science lab, Arthur is a part of the science team! They decide to then split up Steph and Chris in one group and Nick and Anna in another. As they walk, Chris hears Liz and then goes to investigate. He finds her in a storage closet with his grandmother and her heart condition. It appears as though she met her end due to the lack of the medication. Aren't we all just having a great time this Christmas? Anna now tells Nick that she's angry at Nick because she told him all of her hopes and dreams about the future and he broke up with her. That's just high school. Like, that <laughs> crap happens. So she's angry because she trusted him. You know, all that jazz. Broken trust in relationships. I'll tell you, man, it's that time of year. So we now hear Nick say his dad got bit and then told Nick not to let him down, like you always do, which is a little messed up. So that's why he's enjoying taking out as many zombies as possible. Steph and Liz and Chris now continue to try to get out of there. Steph crawls under a table to keep away, but they don't seem very observant of her. In fact, flashing lights appear to be their only focus. As Steph makes a ton of noise, they begin reacting to the sound she's making as she goes to exit out of there once more. They seem to have calmed down at least slightly as the group begins crawling out. And apparently, staying at waist height, they won't see you as well. The question is, why? One of the things I noticed actually was the eyes have changed color concerning the iris. It would appear that with genetic alteration this is possible. It would need to be something more aggressive than just the destruction of your MC1R gene, which is the key gene for human pigmentation. Although there are other genes that are responsible for your pigmentation, so don't just think it's just MC1R. But with the rapid eye color change, this would involve the destruction of the pigmentation itself. It's important to remember, pigmentation is a physical substance within the cell. People tend to forget that for some reason, but its purpose is to protect your genome from harmful destructive power of UV radiation. This material under the direction of the virus appears to have been dismantled for potentially its own components. And this would leave the iris this pale blue color as most of the pigmentation has been destroyed, indicating the infection by virus. Virus. Along with this, the inability to pay attention would denote massive brain damage. As meningitis would continue to get worse, this would put physical pressure on the brain. The pressure can damage the cerebrum, the cerebellum, brainstem, and pretty much everywhere in your skull. Specifically with the infected, considering their aggression levels are elevated, the amygdala is going to be involved, but along with presumably their body temperatures, this is going to involve the hypothalamus coming into play concerning at least that area being damaged. And this is what regulates body temperature. The cerebrum, such as the frontal lobe area, would be damaged, disrupting decision-making properties or like memories of loved ones that they are currently eating. Areas such as temporal lobe or the occipital lobe become more compressed and this would alter vision, as well as making the infected respond to flashing lights on the TV, but really nothing else. And this would also make them like difficult to discern who's walking around as this allowed for them to crawl by because their brain just isn't picking up information like it normally would. They're very movement seems to be a combination also of damage to the cerebellum, which coordinates movement and communication to the motor neurons to the neuromuscular junctions. As the infection appears to affect all cells of the body, or at least most cells of the body, this rigid movement could be due to an issue of either brain damage affecting the ability to move, or even potentially actual muscular death in the body, leading to difficulty moving limbs. However, I'm inclined, I think, to believe that since this is a nervous system virus, that means communication to the body itself is just going to be difficult. Maybe the muscle itself isn't having that many issues, but then again, the gray skin would denote uh, some of the areas of the body are falling apart. They are, however, driven by only pure instinct at this point. They are hungry, they will eat whatever moves. If they are thirsty, they will still presumably drink, as seen with the Dashcon pool incident. My god, what an abomination of event. <laughs> So now one of the things that I do want to bring up is how do the infected know to avoid one another? If you weren't aware, you produce a scent when you are sick. We all do. And that's why you know if somebody's sick. Death also produces a scent as well, and it's sickly sweet. It's kind of gross. But anyhow, once infected by the virus, I believe how the body responds to the toxins is why some get eaten and others do get turned. If the body responds quickly, you will produce a scent that the infected will then not really want to mess with you because you are infected at this point. And it would definitely appear as though the virus is directing you to some degree on spreading this infection. However, if your body reacts more slowly and you are immediately overwhelmed by multiple bites, then it becomes an issue of the infected are hungry. Your body does not have a chance to respond rapidly, in which case you will be eaten. And it's all based on immunological activity. So at this point, Liz gets bitten along with Chris. Ha, oh, nice plan guys. Instantly the infected ignore them once more because they're bit and they hug it out as Steph is now on her own. But again, how is Steph not getting attacked? I have no idea. That part is pretty strange. But possibly due to like the age of Liz and Chris, maybe their bodies responded more quickly to the toxin. And you can see a generalized timeline from here. In a few minutes, they will succumb to the infection. 
However, at first, they are still able to keep together in the end. Viruses do not reproduce this quickly under any circumstances because it's pretty much based on how fast cellular machinery can operate. Now, these can be tweaked to a degree, but there is still a physical limitation on how a cell can behave that the virus cannot influence. As such, when the eyes turn blue, this is the virus fully saturating their bodies. However, a person will experience massive brain damage prior to this due to the toxins, along with the infection in their neuronal tissue, ultimately creating more issues down the line. Joy bound. So Anna now approaches her dad where the Christmas play was. Arthur has created a barrier as she finds her dad. No way we are breaking into a musical number right now. They're not going to do it. They can and they do it. Okay, well, we actually are. So what a fever dream. As she starts stacking bodies, she sings while the headmaster dances in the background. This movie is, again, one giant acid trip. Freeing her father, Arthur just stands there like a right proper weirdo. Mr. Shepard then punches Arthur in the face, as Arthur then goes to crack a bottle, going after the dad. A fight ensues as Arthur is then placed over the infected, but allowed to live. At a certain point, you gotta ask yourself, after all the betrayal, why let him have another chance to betray you? But luckily, the Dead Space 2 star makes its glorious return and knocks the headmaster back into the infected. Sunrise, sunset. It's a beautiful process. But in that process, though, Anna's dad got bitten by one of the infected. Eh, tough break. Having a nice cry, I mean, you could maybe always lob off the leg, but then again, that's a lot of blood lost. So the old man shares a nice talk with her as Nick arrives. So she says Merry Christmas and then leaves with Nick. As they walk outside, the zombies are everywhere. Still don't know how these forms of zombies overwhelm the freaking military. Uh, they move at like one mile per hour at best. But it is now at this point a solid five minutes since the last song has happened as we break out into singing once more. And essentially what it comes down to is life can be a complete crapshoot sometimes, but as long as you're still breathing, you gotta forge ahead. Felt that one, brother. So as the snow begins to fall, a car arrives with Steph behind the wheel. They then get in and head out on this nice Christmas morning covered in blood as they discuss where to go next. Well, we could hit up Depression Point or maybe even Life is Pain Ravine. So then we get a jump scare of Santa because of course, and thus concludes Anna and the Apocalypse. Never thought I'd be covering a musical on this channel, but tis the season, I reckon. So this is clearly a neurological based infection. I would even hazard a guess as to say the blood remains relatively unaffected by the fact that everyone is covered in the stuff, yet they never seem to contract this illness. Initially, starting as a respiratory virus, ultimately it would be transferred by bites, which may be either due to the fact that the salivary glands are actually secreting this virus, or potentially it's housed in the lungs and it'll come up quite regularly, allowing it to exist in the mouth, and then after a bite, it's allowed to infect the next person. For this virus to operate as it does, and for the neurons to remain functional for an extended period of time, the very metabolism of a cell would need to be changed, which may be housed in the genetic coding of this retrovirus. Ultimately, the body does seem to be responding to the infection, and given enough time, maybe it could even overcome it. But most of the interactions seem to be spawned by brain damage, as well as a drive by the virus to continue to infect. I would have to assume the adaptive immune system may still be at play, however, as the rest of the body appears to be surviving, to say the least, I suppose, and sweating is a big indicator of a fever. It may be essentially antibodies could be created to deal with the invader, but the brain would still be compromised and the infection would still be located within them permanently. Depending on the bite location, seeing as it travels via the circulatory system, a tourniquet or even possibly lobbing off the limb would be your best bet, but you would have to react rather quickly for that, so it might not be as easy as you think. But anyhow, I would say Merry Christmas and thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave me a like would be great of you, and subscribe is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Row Note Tales link, and merch store if you're interested in that. I have some uh, Christmas shirts up now. It's pretty cool. I like them. But speaking of patrons, I'd also like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronaut, the Soviet robot. Thank you, sir. Next, I'd like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as our scientists, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B-Grade Horror Movies, Dakota 23, Florian, Lucian Dragon, Octavia Serpentia, and The Last Final Girl on the left. Thank you very much, guys. And to the rest of my patrons, I also appreciate you as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running, so thank you. All right, well, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. Have a good Christmas. I should definitely have something out before the new year, but if not, have a happy new year, and I'll see y'all in the next one.